Oh, shalom, my friends, shalom, my enemies. This is your old pal, Rabbi Saul Solomon, founder and spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And I am delighted and thrilled and excited to be talking to a wonderful A-list Hollywood actress who is with us in the neighborhood today. You can recognize her already because you know her from Princey's Honor and you know her from Peggy Sue Got Married and Romancing the Stone. And she was even the voice of Jessica Rabbit. Way, all these, all these incredible movies. She's also a theater person. She was on stage on Broadway in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? I'm afraid of everything. I'm Jewish. So yes, I'm afraid of Virginia Woolf. She's also doing her memoir biographical, autobiographical show at Kingsborough, on stage at Kingsborough in Brooklyn, New York. This is happening next Shabbos, next Saturday, November 5th. So you're going to want to get tickets at onstage at kingborough.org. Won't you please welcome the creator of Finding My Voice, one of the great voices in Hollywood, Kathleen Turner. Shalom, Kathleen. How are you? Shalom, Dave. I'm fine. I'm actually, Dave is the producer of the program. I'm oh, Rabbi Saul. Your this is, this I say is, again? Uh, my name is Rabbi Saul. Saul. You can call me Saul. Oh, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. Oh, you're Saul. Saul. So, or, good morning. Good morning to you. You can call me Rabbi or Monsignor, whatever, whatever floats your boat. But okay. it's a delight to see you. Are you is are you at home or are you already pra- backstage somewhere where you're doing a show today? No, I'm home. I'm home. I got in last night from uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. Well, Ed Mazel. And, and let me ask you about this Finding My Voice. Because you've been doing this for a few years, developing it in cabarets and going across the country. Did you start this almost like a decade ago, or or for how long did it develop? Did it germinate? Oh, at least five years ago, I think. I was uh, doing a play down at Arena Stage in Washington, D.C. I was doing uh, Mother Courage, and the character has five songs in the play. It is not a musical, thank you, but it is uh, a play with music, with songs. And so I started working with this, with a pianist and a brilliant singer and and, um, director to make sure I would do a good job of the songs because I never had sung in public. Well, it turned out I did it very well indeed. And when I got back from the production, which was thrilling, I asked them to keep working with me because I wanted to explore, to see where this might lead, what I, what I might do. And I love telling stories like you. And so I would tell a story when a thought came up from a song. And then Andy, my director, would, would say, well, that, that sounds like this song. And then Mark, my pianist, would say, well, I know exactly how to arrange that. And before you knew it, we were entertaining each other so much that we sort of went, well, you know what? This could be a show. And so we we did. We started in cabaret spaces and we took it to London um, to a, a, a theater on, called The Other the Other Place. And then we brought it back to Cafe Carlisle. We've been it every show every generation of it the stories change depending on the jobs i do and so then the songs change and now i've got so much i have to pick and choose what i want to do that night because you've lived so much life and you have so many more stories and i I will say that my dear wife miriam libby so because i've done a a one-person show as well with music and the accompanist is so important my wife is always telling my dear wife she says oh i wish you had a bigger pianist and, and or at least that's what it sounds like she's saying. I'm not 100% sure on this, but, it, but, but she's right either way. This is true. Now, let me ask you, what is a story that you've added without giving too much away from in the last six months or so that wasn't there like three years ago when you, or five years ago when you were developing this? Well, it, it depends on, I suppose now I would tell, add a story from the Kaminsky Method from the Netflix show with Michael Douglas because I shot that within, so much depends on the work and when I've done the work, you know. 
So, and, and let me ask you, I, I, you since you brought it up, everybody's going to wonder, so are you still friends with Michael Douglas and you get along great and you still, you know. Oh, yeah. yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, no, we, we're good friends. We care very much for each other and we love working together. What, what is, because everybody also wants to know about these people that you've worked with over the years. So you obviously have a chemistry, a kinship with him. Um, what, what, what's an acute anecdote you can tell us? about him on the set or off the set or just, just something lovely and fun? Well, uh, when I talk about romancing and uh, that mudslide, we did that uh, five times. And uh, Michael always, I, I, came, I came out of that shoot with about seven or eight stitches, I think, from not just that incident, but others. And um, Michael says that I am the only leading lady he knows who would, who could possibly put up with all that pain. <laughs> was, well, was there a point, I mean, when you're young, you, unfortunately, in some ways, there are actresses who are like, when they're first starting, they'll take hand, they'll do anything, they'll, they'll go oh. on the Harvey Weinstein couch or something like that. But, but you were like, you know, if it's for the role and it's a legitimate thing, I mean, I mean. And, yeah, I, no, that's fine. But also, also above that, on top of that, I never wanted to do work I had already done. I never wanted to repeat myself. So if someone, you know, body heat happened and they said, oh my God, she's so sexy. So I said, okay, that's enough of that. And um, the next role was with Steve Martin and Carl Reiner, uh, The Man With Two Brains, which was a takeoff, a spoof about the femme fatale, you know, Dolores Benedict kind of thing. And then came the shy, insecure um, writer of romancing that grew into herself. And then after that, I went and did Crimes of Passion for Ken Russell. And you should have heard the screams then. Um, you wait, know. wait, 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 because that, that goes back to the sexy side. What, what was the, what, it was Ken Russell. So when Ken, Ken Russell makes Russell. a movie, it's just, you know, it's all over the- It was, he, you know, I've always considered him, I still do. Uh, a genius. He's he's a flawed genius, but he was a genius, you know. Aren't we all? Aren't we all? Uh, so so also. Uh, by the way, we're talking with Kathleen Turner here, of course. Since you mentioned, since you also brought up body heat, uh, and and again the 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 personal and the private, the public and and the, the persona. So you know the, when Bill Hurt died a, a couple of months ago, yeah. the revolutions uh, revel, the revelations came out that. You know, he, he could be allegedly a rather terrible person to some of the people he was with. Did you have any of that? I don't, I don't gossip. I oh, don't. Oh. I don't right. know about any of my any of the people I work with. Well, do you have any good stories? In other words, uh, uh, working with him, where he surprised you in a pleasant way, or or his method. Well, to... one of the great things about working with Bill and Larry Kasdan was the three of us came back together on Accidental Tourist. And it was gorgeous to see how we had all matured, uh, how much we had learned, you know, how we had changed. It was a wonderful opportunity of a lesson in life. Oh, cool. Let me ask you, speaking of, of working with people and, and how different people work, because you work with Larry Kasdan and all these different directors, do you have any John Waters stories? <laughs> John is still a very dear friend. And... Um, Oh, we laughed. God, we laughed so much when we were uh, shooting Serial Mom. Uh, I'll tell you the secret about John is that his humor sometimes seems very uh, raw or rough, uh, but that's only because he, he sees people so clearly, but this, the second he senses that he's actually hurt someone's feelings, he pulls back, he pulls away, he tries, he apologizes. He's, he's really such a softy. And he has the ability to take people who are really unattractive and make you care about them. And that speaks to his compassion. I mean, who can forget Edith, the egg lady and females? I mean, come on, I loved her. Edith Massey, what, what a legend, what a wonderful, oh my God. Um, let, me, let me ask you. Um, Speaking of the, the sexiness thing, you grew up, though, as kind of a very uh, straight-laced or were raised as a Christian, serious, boom, boom, boom. How did you reconcile 
that, didn't you? With, you know, with a pretty serious, and then having to do sexy roles and occasional nudity and, and things like that. Well, my grandfather, my, yeah, my, no, my great grandfather was a missionary to China. And my father grew up in China. He was brought up by two great aunts, very Victorian uh, great aunt. So yes, he had a certain strictness and belief that. But when it came to religion itself, first of all, we went just to English speaking churches because we lived overseas usually. And so it was sort of a more important to find a community of English speakers sometimes than uh, any particular religion. There, there wasn't any one particular religion, although you could say it was all Christian, yes. Um, but no, in this sense, my, my mother and, and my father were both very liberal, you know, that everyone absolutely had the right to their beliefs, period. Oh. Oh, I did. I need to reread uh, your Wikipedia listing because I, I said you were in a, a strict Christian household, and I guess that is not a correct necessary thing. Which not is not correct. Wrong. By the way, and, and, to, and also the whole missionary thing. I'm, I'm absolutely for. Well, at least a missionary position. But let me ask you though. <laughs> you don't even laugh. You just kind of give me a look, like, "Oh, he's saying something stupid." I'm just going to let that roll, and then I'm going <laughs> to wait for the next question. But, but where is your, if you have any kind of religious or or spirituality thing now do you do are you christian or are you just kind of zen um, no 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 that's none of your business what what where what do you none of your business oh, oh my really? business. okay our mind yes uh, I, I, religion tends to be my business because uh, last i looked i was a rabbi but that's a question I, I tend to ask people so let me ask you uh, about another co-worker another colleague and tell me something about so, someone brilliant because on broadway uh, in fact, the producer of the show, Dave, saw you a few years ago in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, where mm -hmm. you acted with Bill Irwin, who yeah. is just this brilliant mime movement person, actor. Do you have a Bill Irwin story? Uh, Bill, I asked Bill to read George when I when Albie said I could do um, a reading for him. Uh, my first thought was, Bill, because I felt that the comedy had never been realized in the play that no production I had see, I had heard of because I took care never to see it. I didn't want anyone else in my head, you know? Um, I, I thought that uh, he would be absolutely perfect for George. He, you, his mind is so wicked sharp and smart and fast. And, and that's George, you know, you really can see uh, his thinking and and uh, I I was right. I mean, Bill got the Tony for it. He, he was brilliant. And if you saw his Samuel Beckett thing, if you got to see that uh, that he was doing off Broadway. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, but let me but let me also ask you, since you you we move in this direction, you didn't want to see other people playing Martha in Who's Afraid of Virginia? But no. you can't not have being an actress, being whatever, have seen the movie with Elizabeth Taylor. I saw some scenes from it uh, occasionally, but I would never watch the whole thing. And it made me very angry um, because it was everything that people were prejudiced and pre-thought about the play. First of all, and the biggest mistake for which I really do blame Mike Nichols was George is never drunk. George comes in in the first scene, pours himself a drink, and nurses it for the rest of the play. Uh, it's not two drunks screaming at each other. Martha is the only one who's drunk, along with Honey and Nick, but George is never drunk. And I think that makes an immense, immense difference. It means that George is always aware, always sober enough to decide to choose his actions. And Irwin, you know, went in that, it's been a while, but he went that way. And he is oh, yeah. the master manipulator in a manner of speaking of the, the evening, in a way. Yeah. Now, but, but again, we get to another film that you can't not have seen. At some point you have, either in your teenage years or whatever, you must have seen The Graduate, right? With, yes. with Yes, I think well, I did, 
very, very long ago. Very long ago, huh? Um, but then you had to go on stage in The Graduate and be Mrs. Robinson to block out um, um, Mel Brooks's wife. What, the, what was her? Oh, my God. Anne, Anne Bancroft. Yeah. So yes, well, I, was, I heard that she was not happy that it was being done as a stage piece. But I will say that Terry Johnson, who wrote the play, uh, it was so fresh, the, his, the way and how he wrote it. Um, I, he, he actually said to me, you know, if you've got something of equal shock value to her nudity, if you can do it with in underwear or half dressed or how, you know, that he'd be willing to consider it. Uh, and it, it, there isn't, there isn't anything as powerful, as shocking as that, um, as that total nudity. So I said, okay, I guess we, we have to do it. I wasn't happy, thrilled about it, you know, just thinking about it. But heavens, it's so, it's part of the role. It's just, becomes part of the character. So it's not something you end up really thinking about either. Well, actually, I was I'm, I'm, I'm interesting that you brought up. I was even thinking just blocking out and Bancroft for your mind so that you don't do her. Oh, that That's wasn't not, a problem. Never, no. Even, no, even material, having seen her. No, the material was so different. Let me ask you, in because you're obviously a theater creature as much as a, a movie creature. Oh, that, more. More, but so what was the first show you ever saw? Life, life stage thing. I saw, I, when I was 13, my father was uh, posted to the court of St. James to London. And so the first night we were there, I crept out of the hotel and got into the gods, which is the fourth tier uh, in British theaters. It's, it's so far up that really, you, you know, if you have a problem with heights, don't go there. Um, and I think it was Mame with Angela Lansbury. And I remember sitting there thinking, oh my God, I can make my living at this. I could, I could pay my rent doing this. And that was such a gift, you know, not to, to think of it. The British see acting as a profession, as a trained, skilled profession. In this country, in the United States, we still seem to think about it as something that happens. Oh, you happen to be right for it, or you happen in the right place at the right time. Um, rubbish, rubbish. One of my passions now is, is teaching. And I just got back from a session at uh, University of Virginia, where I work with the graduate students in acting. And um, I love it, I love doing it. And I think it's something I'm good at, but it's just, no, this is not, you don't do eight shows a week because you happen to be good at something. You do it because you have every sense extend, extended into the sound, the sight, the feel, the air, the space. And you can actually, you know, live it eight times a week. It's, it's an extraordinary feeling of being alive. Um, but it's not for sissies. When do you when do you get these grad students though? What? How can you teach acting? I mean, what what is? I was like, okay, you have to listen to the other person and react. That's that's ninety five percent. But what else, what can you teach? If you see a scene, how do you critique it? It's more than that. I mean, this last session we worked on communication with directors, um, the sport you owe or would give to a director, um, self-directing, because you're not always gonna get a director who's that capable. Uh, all of the above, with three new short plays and three different new directors to them. Uh, all, of, all of this was, so they had to get up and in its two and a half hours stage um, with this director, uh, a new piece, um, a piece unknown to them. And it's, my idea being that it took me a couple of years after so-called, you know, I graduated from college to learn how much more an actor can do in terms of 
helping the playwright in terms of helping and supporting the director in terms of supporting the other actors and even the design elements uh, around you. And I wanted, I wanted to start these guys off um, with a step up into that, into a more professional readiness, yeah? All right. Well, but I am curious then. I mean, how do you how do you keep an actor that an actor sort of also has to know his or her place in terms of you don't tell the director what to do. Or you don't look at your fellow actor and sort of say, I know the director's telling you this, but one should try that. I mean, or, or, or... It's, uh, it's very simple. It's very simple how you say, what if? What if I were to move this way at that time and see how the other actor would counter or how the director likes it? Um, no, you, you, do, you don't say no. Once you have said yes to a role, you've said yes to it all. You know, to the playwright, to the producer, to the director, to the, to the investors, for heaven's sake. Um, so there is no no once you've agreed to a role. But there is so much an actor can do, much more than simply being a prop on stage, you know? Yes. Uh, to be part of the creative process of a production. Well, what is the best piece of directing advice that you ever got, either from a stage director or for, for you know, someone behind the camera? Well, the director I'm working with, Andy Gale, in Finding My Voice, uh, gave me a great direction in one song I was doing. He said, you know, what if you didn't attack it quite so much? Mm-hmm. And I thought, okay, I'll look at that. And it was better. And I said, okay, you got me on that one. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you collaborate. And, and uh, by the way, we might as well tell people that some of the songs that you sing in your one person show, it's called Finding My Voice. There's I'd Rather Be Sailing. That's a William Finn song, I think, from A New Brain. Uh, are you still doing that one or is that one? Oh, yeah. No, that's, I, that could very well be my favorite song. Oh, it's, it's a lovely, lovely. What else? What other tunes are in there? that people can hear Kathleen Turner sing on stage at Kingsborough next Saturday. Oh, well, there's a section of uh, when I'm starting out as an actor and growing in that goes from Paper Moon to um, to Anywhere I Hang My Hat is Home to um, Sweet Kentucky Ham to uh, On the Street Where We Live. And that's sort of starting out launching myself, starting to feel that power and everything, starting to get worn down by the road and the loneliness and the being away and then coming home. That is a, well, that is a typical actor's journey. Yours, your life was a little less typical and unfortunately curtailed on some level by physical ailment. How are you, by the way, in terms of the arthritis and all, and all of that? I'm getting better. I was, I had a bad, time last month I was I tried a new medication that was not for me let's say and that uh, set me back a bit but um, it's coming back just have to have to heal a little more so is, is it this recurring gloomy like you get bad weeks and then good weeks or I mean I, I, I don't know how the hell days. this works yeah days and, you know in, in, in a bad day is you know and the next day you're better. Well, would you be able to do a, an eight week or a, sorry, eight show a week thing on Broadway? I don't think I would. I don't think I would take it because that's, um, if I were unable, then uh, that would be uh, unkind. It would be uh, breaking my contract to my mind. So I would not take on that responsibility now. Would you take on another theatrical show if it weren't that kind of schedule? Like like Off-Broadway just oh, sure. a week ago, you had Hal Linden and, and Bernie Capel doing Two Jews Talking, right? One is 89, the other is 99 years old. I think I did old. that show. What, what, I, think right? I, I think I did that, Too Much Tuna Fish. <laughs> no, that, that was um, the Tuna oh. Fish thing. Was, that was the guys from, um, oh, what the hell were their names? Uh, oh, hello. Oh, hello. That yeah. was... That's a different yeah. show. This is this yeah. is two okay. people talking, um, but you know the combined age of these two men is 108, mm-hmm. and so they do four shows. They 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 start on like Thursday or Friday night. They do two shows on a Shabbos Sunday afternoon, and then they go away for four days because you know at 90. Recover. Yeah. yeah. 
But could that, you? That's a possibility, definitely. Well, what are you working on, if anything, besides uh, finding my voice? What, what's what's well, lots of films? Hmm? Lots of films. I had a film come out in October, opened at the at the Toronto Film Festival, and that will have more of a release called The Swearing Jar. And I have a film coming out in November called The Estate. And I'll be shooting a film again in December, a new one called uh, Fear No, uh, Have No Fear. And then in January on HBO, uh, the White House Plumbers series starts with- Is that Watergate or, uh, is that huh? Watergate or what is that about? The White House plumbers, or is it? Just oh, it's about it's about Alderman and Ehrlichman and those fools. That it's actually about what they really did. It was so insane, and they they thought they could get away with it all. It's so funny, but and it's all true. And I play this woman, Dita Beard, who kind of cracked cracked the whole thing open because she's the one who wrote uh, a check to bribe. Uh, Attorney General Mitchell for $400,000. I would take it. No, no. She she ended up with uh, a nice horse farm in Virginia, unlike the others who ended up, I hope, think in jail. Well, can I also think of of living? I mean, do are you by coast? Do you live mostly in one place? I live only in New York City. New York. Why did you choose? You could you could live in a, a mansion. Well, you could probably have a really wonderful place in, in Manhattan. But why New York as opposed to L.A. or back to oh. you know, South or something? Well, in, uh, you know, in large part because I grew up as a citizen of the world, in a sense. Huh? And New York is the closest I can get to the rest of the world in our country. <clears throat> and And post-pandemic, are you tra- I mean, uh, travel a bit or a lot? <clears throat> Because I'm traveling, I'm traveling a little too much into my mind. I had to run out to LA last week because, well, to see Norman Lear, because he is an old and dear. I serve on the board of People for the American Way for 39 years. You must know of Rabbi David Saperstein. Yeah. All Jews he's, know each other. It, it's, it's a pipe. Oh, no, he's yeah. a very well known Jew. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, you know, but, and, uh, this also brings up, I know we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have much more time with you. I know you have to, you know, you're welcome to stay and yeah. play the trivia game, but I know you, you, you can't do it. But, but um, in terms of actors and, and people in the high with a spotlight on them being overtly and openly political, which you certainly are. I mean, you're on Planned Parenthood, People from the American Way. What's the other one? Uh, Meals on Wheels, which... Yes. I mean, that shouldn't be political at all. That's just an activism thing. Do you think performers should be obligated if they're in the spotlight to go that extra mile and say, this is how I feel and this is how you should feel and I'm doing this? I don't this. think obligated is the right word. I think you should realize what a responsibility it is and choose carefully you know, what you say publicly. But I think if you feel strongly about something, of course, it's your right to speak up. Now, let me let me have you speak up one more time before we let you go. We're talking with Kathleen Turner. Please go see her next Saturday at Kingsborough. It's, it's in Kingsborough Community College, but they got well, right. Right, Mike Tallis. Kingsborough Community College on stage at Kingsborough in the Oxford section of Brooklyn. Get your tickets on stage at kingsborough.org or you go to Kathleen Turner. Dot net is her thing. But let me ask you, in doing the finding my voice thing from here to there, there, is there a story that was in that you would love to have in there, but you know, it, it's a certain amount of time, it would just the evening would be too long. Can you tell us something that isn't in the show that you wish were? Yes, I like I'd like time to do more um, Molly Ivans, who, who I, I perform in a one woman show called Red Hot Patriot, the kick ass wit of Molly Ivans who was a brilliant, you know, brilliant political humorist and journalist, primarily with the Texas Observer. Um, she actually died uh, almost 15 years ago. And a lot of the, in her last column uh, is the ending of the play. And I would love to be able to put more of that in, 
in the show, but it really is too long. But uh, everything she wrote then is more true now. And that's frightening and illuminating. And thank God she uses her humor to, to get you to listen. It has been illuminating and delightful and wonderful having this kick-ass conversation with Kathleen Turner. Please go see her next Shabbos in Brooklyn. Get your tickets. Kathleen, uh, I may say it's just been absolutely an honor and delight talking with you. We'd love to have you back in the neighborhood sometime. But yeah. good health, my, more, more important than anything else, good health to you and much more great work. Thank you for being with us in the neighborhood. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Likewise. Bye-bye now. Kathleen Turner, my friends. Oh, my God, how wonderful. Shalom and shalom. This is your old pal, Rabbi Saul Solomon. Find out more about me, because, you know, this is mostly about me. Shalomdammit.com is my website. I'm going to bring back Dave. You all know Dave. Dave is coming back to the neighborhood to play the Today, Yesterday trivia quiz with some wonderful people. What else the hell? I don't know what else the hell he's doing. He's doing whatever else he does, and Dave's gone by. Until then, let me play a little bit of music to ease my way out of here. Here's some klezma hits for Chal